for the following functions f of x, we want to know three things. Does f inverse exist? If so, find f inverse. And if so, sketch f inverse. So our first function is going to be f of x equal to x minus 3 cubed plus 4. If I want to check whether f inverse exists or not, one thing we can do is see if it's increasing or decreasing everywhere. If so, then we'll have an inverse. So let's see what happens. So we take f prime, drop 3, subtract 1 off the exponent. That gives me 3x minus 3 squared. Now, if I square any number, it's going to be non-negative, meaning we're either going to get 0 or a positive number. So this will always be greater than or equal to 0, and equal to 0 only at the point x equal to 3. So if I'm looking at the regions, we take x equal to 3, and that's going to be increasing on both sides, since the derivative is always positive off of x equals 3. So that means we're increasing everywhere, so f inverse exists. If you want to take it one step further, we can look at the graph. You'll notice that this is increasing everywhere, and also it satisfies the horizontal line property, meaning if I take any horizontal line, we're going to wind up cutting the graph in exactly one spot. Okay, we can check that just by looking. So that means my function is one to one. Now let's take a look at finding f inverse the function. To do this, we're going to take our original function, switch x and y, and then we solve for y. So if y was equal to x minus 3 cubed plus 4, I'm now going to be looking at x equal to y minus 3 cubed plus 4. The 4 can go to the other side. I can then cube root both sides. That's going to leave me with a y minus 3, and then I just push the 3 to the other side, which gives me y equals 3 plus cube root of x minus 4. Now, I shouldn't be happy with that. We have a check, so let's take a look at that. So my check is going to be, well, you have two options. You can go either f inverse on f of x returns x, or f of f inverse of x returns x. We'll go with this one. So what's the idea here? I'm going to take f of x, stick it inside of f inverse, and see what happens. So if you're a little skittish about sticking in and doing you know, your composition abstractly like this, just think of it this way. I'm going to take a box, put box into the function, and then I can just start collapsing things. So if my box is x minus 3 cubed plus 4, that just goes in as is. So let's start pulling this apart. The 4s are going to go away, leaving me with x minus 3 cubed, cube root. Well, if you notice, the cube root's just taking things to a third power, so the 3 and the 1 third are going to go away. We have 3 plus x minus 3, and that's equal to x. And so our check works out. So we know we found the right function. So now all I have to do is sketch the function. How do we do that? Well, we're going to take the line y equal to x, and then just flip our original graph in that line. All we're doing is switching x and y, so think of it this way. Our critical point was at the point 3 comma 4. So if I switch x and y, that's going to go to the point 4 comma 3. Another point I have on here for free is the intercept. If I put 0 into the function, I get 0 minus 23. When I flip in the line y equals x, that's going to give me minus 23, 0. Let's take a look at some other things. Well. We also notice just by looking at concavity changes when we're at the point 3 comma 4, on the right hand side it's concave up, the left hand side's concave down. Now you notice if I flip in this line y equals x, the bowl going up is going to flip to bowl down. This bowl down is going to flip to bowl up. So let's see how that looks. Well, 3, 4 goes to 4, 3, so that's going to mean everything on the right of 4, 3 is going to turn into concave down. Everything on the left is going to switch from concave down to concave up. One other thing I have, okay, we also have this point on the x-axis, so that's just going to move to the y-axis in the same position. So that'll give me one more point on the y-axis, and now you can just kind of connect the dots and try to keep the concavity there. 
for my next function, let's consider f of x equal to the absolute value of x minus 2 plus the absolute value of x minus 1. Now this thing, just looking at it, I can't take a derivative, so I need to pull it apart and see what's really happening. So if you recall, the definition of absolute value is take what's inside, if it's a positive number, we leave it alone. If it's a negative number, we throw away the minus sign, which is the same as saying multiply by minus 1. All right, so I put that in for both of my expressions. Notice we're getting functions without absolute value signs on them. And then I just figure out what each function gets assigned to each region. And I'll label these so it's easier to track what's happening when we collapse. So if you notice, this is going to give me three regions, below 1, between 1 and 2, and above 2. If I look for everything below 1, that's going to be region 2 and region 4 together. So 2 and 4, that's going to be less than 2 and less than 1, which is just less than 1. We add up what we get from each of those pieces. So that's going to give me 3 minus 2x. We go to the region between 1 and 2. That's going to correspond to the 2 plus 3. So that's going to be bigger than 1, but less than 2. We add them together, the x's go away, and I'm just left with 1. And then for my last region, that's 1 and 3. That's bigger than 1, bigger than 2, which just turns into bigger than 2. So that's going to give me 2x minus 3. Now these are all straight line segments, so graphing is not a problem. We're going to have intercept 3, slope minus 2, and that's going to have 0 in there, so we actually are going to go through the y-axis with this one. Between 1 and 2, we're looking at the horizontal piece, y equals 1. And then over here, we're looking at 2x minus 3, so we won't go for the intercept. We'll just note that if I put a 2 in there, we get a 1 out, so it connects perfectly to that, and then the slope is 2, so we're just going to go up 2 over 1, draw that straight line segment in. So, does this function have an inverse? Well, the answer is no, because it's not one-to-one. -one. It's going to fail the horizontal line test. If I take any horizontal line above one, we're going to hit the graph in more than two spots. So it's not one-to-one, -one, therefore it can't have an inverse. And then we're done. For my last example, let's check f of x equal to 2, radical x minus 3, plus 1. First, let's check the domain. For the radical to make any sense, whatever's going in has to be greater than or equal to 0. So I need x minus 3 greater than or equal to 0, or x greater than or equal to 3. To see if f inverse exists, I'm going to check the derivative. So this is just x minus 3 to the 1 half. We bring the 1 half down, and then we subtract 1 off the exponent, and then take the derivative of the inside for the chain rule. But that's only going to be a 1, so it doesn't really affect this. That's going to mean we're looking at derivative. Okay, minus 1 half means we can put that thing in the bottom. So I have 1 over radical x minus 3. Okay, radical of anything always returns a positive number. So this is always going to be positive, except at 3 in our domain where it blows up. But that's fine. Everywhere else, this is going to be increasing. So we'll have an inverse function. Next, we want to solve to get the equation for f inverse. So I start with my y equals 2 radical x minus 3 plus 1. We're going to switch x and y and then just solve for y. So we do our switch. I can move the minus 1 over to here. 1 goes as minus 1. Square both sides. And then we just move the 3 to the other side, 4 to the bottom, and that gives me my inverse function. Okay, we should always check this. So what I want to use here is the version f, inverse f, is equal to x, because that'll be the easier one. So what I do is, well, I have my function here for f inverse of x, so I'm just going to pick that up in a box, and then our box is going to go where x was in our original function. 
So we stick that in. We're two radical box minus three plus one. And now I can start crunching. The threes go away, leaving me with x minus one squared over four. I can reduce that. Okay, that square root's gonna just kill the square. And then it's gonna turn the four into a two. The twos go, and then the ones go, and I'm left with x. So this is in fact the inverse function. Let's see what else we have. Okay, if I want to sketch this, we want to flip in the line y equals x. So let's pick a few points and we'll track what happens to those points. Well, if I have the point 3 comma 1, that's given by putting 3 in here. That's going to turn that to 0 and then I get a 1 out. That's going to be one point which is corresponding right to the edge of the domain. Another good point, which I just get by staring at the function for a while to figure out what a nice number is. If I put a 4 in there, I'm going to get 2 times 1 plus 1 gives me 3. So that's going to give me over 4, up 3. I want to track where these points go. So the roll is going to be flipping the line y equals x, but that's also for points switching the y and the x. So 3, 1 is going to go to 1, 3 and 4, 3 is going to go to 3, 4. So I can plot those two points, and we notice the graph was originally facing down, bowl down, concave down. So when I flip, it's going to be concave up. So that'll give me a little bit nicer idea of what the graph looks like. Okay, now at this point, it's probably driving some people nuts. Notice I don't have a full parabola here, Okay, we only have half a parabola, and that's correct. So the problem is, in part two, we really have to be careful about restricting our domain, because we only care about the piece of the parabola which is greater than or equal to one. So we have to tack that on to my solution for two. Now, notice, does this make sense? Well, yes, because if I had the full parabola, all right, if I take the inverse of an inverse function, it returns the original function. If I had a full parabola here and I flipped in y equals x, I'm going to have a full parabola here on its side, and that thing can't be a function. Okay, if I do the vertical line test, I'm going to intersect in two points, and that's bad for functions. So the reason we have to have this restriction is so that it makes sense. Okay, if I want this thing to be a function when I flip, we got to cut half of the parabola off. 